All right, in this video, we're going to talk about describing quantitative data with numbers. So I'm going to break this down to two parts, part one and part two, and this is part one of describing quantitative data with numbers. All right, so let's first start talking about an example to kind of understand what we're going to do with this video. The example is how long do people spend traveling to work? This is commonly referred to as a person's commute time. We asked 15 workers in Ohio what their commute times were in minutes one way. This is how long it took them to get to work in minutes one way. Here's all of our data. And I conveniently put into a nice stem and leaf plot for us. It's a very nice way to organize our data. And we see the little key there explain that a 2 and a 5 means that it takes 25 minutes for those people to get to work. Now, we want to describe with words and numbers. That's a good way that we're going to move forward when we talk about data. So we're still going to talk about our four main characteristics of data, shape, center, spread, outliers. First, to talk about shape, we're still going to have to use words. So make sure to write full sentences in context to the problem. So in this case, going back to this graph right here, what I would say about the shape is I would say the commute times are skewed to the right and unimodal with most times clustered around 10 to 20 minutes. So one more time, if I tilt my head, I definitely see that more data is towards the lower numbers than the, than the higher numbers. That's why I said skewed to the right. Um, and then most of the data is clustered again in the 10s and 20s. So somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes is where we see most of the data. So again, just describing the shape. I even use the word unimodal there because in the 10s, we definitely see where there's a huge chunk of data. Okay, now we want to talk about center, and we're going to talk about two specific ways to talk about center in this video, both of which I'm sure you heard of. The first is mean, and the second is median. Let's talk about the mean first. The mean is the arithmetic average of all the values. The symbol for the mean of a sample of data is X bar. Okay, it's literally pronounced X bar. It's an X with a bar over top of it. So X bar is the sample mean, the mean of a sample. How do you find that? Well, you simply add up all of your observations and then divide by your total sample size, which we call N. So keep that in mind. Pretty much for the rest of the year, we're going to allow the letter N to represent our sample size. So N represents your sample size. So for our example that we did earlier, um, that we were talking about back all the way back up to here is we had 15 workers. So again, our sample size for that particular problem would be 15 because we looked at 15 um, total people. You get the idea. So the Greek letter sigma, this little Greek letter right here represents uh, sigma. It means the summation or add them all up. Okay. So another way that we could write the formula for the mean or X bar is basically using this Greek letter that says add up all the individual values. That's what the little I stands for, all the individual values, and then divide by N. I don't really need a big formula to show you guys this, but it's pretty simple to understand. Add up all the individual values, divide by how many total values you have, that's the mean. Now, notation is extremely important. I want this to be very clear from this particular day all the way forward to the rest of the year. We have two symbols that we use that represent mean. X bar represents the mean of a sample where this symbol down here is mu. This is the mean of a population. So let's just say that we sample 15 people. That's our sample size, right? We'd sample 15 people. We get an average of that sample. We would use X bar to represent the mean of the sample. Now, we could understand and we could reference the mean of the population. Now, understand this, that we'll never really know the mean of the population because we would need to know how long every single person in the state of Ohio commutes to work. We're never going to know that, but we can kind of theorize or um, hypothesize what that value would be, and that's where we get this symbol mu. Again, it looks like a U. It's got a little bit longer tail, so you make that front tail kind of longer. Looks like a U. It's pronounced mu, M-U, and this is the symbol that we use to kind of theorize what the population population mean could be. We oftentimes aren't going to actually know this number, but I want you guys to understand something very simple in this class. Our goal is to use a sample mean, and if it's a good, accurate sample, hopefully it could mirror or represent what that true population mean can be. So making sure you understand the difference between those two symbols is pretty important in this class. 
Okay, here's a couple facts about the mean. The mean is very sensitive to the influence of extreme observations. The mean cannot be resistant to the uh, influence of outliers. So it's not resistant to the re influence of outliers. If the data has a large upper outlier, the mean has to take it into account and therefore gets pulled higher towards that upper outlier. Same thing, if data has a really low outlier, the mean will get pulled down towards it. I have an example here where we see the basically the same set of data. 8, 8, 9, 9, 9.5, 9.5, 10, 10, 10.6, 10.6, 12.7, 12.7. .7. But in this case, the highest value is 13. And in the bottom case, the highest value is 50. 50 is clearly a big outlier. It's way far away from the rest of the data. So we see how this small change to our data really affects the mean. In the top set of data, the mean is 10.4. Makes a lot of sense. 10.4 is a good representation of this data. But down here, because this outlier, the mean is 15.69. And that's a really weird mean. I mean, actually 15.69 is higher than almost every value except for the 50. So this is an observation of what happens with an outlier. It pulled the means towards it, all right? You could look at like this if you're interested in basketball, right? Let's say that you have played five games and you score two points, four points, four points, zero points, and then you have a game where you score 30 points. Well, your average is going to look like you maybe average a lot of points, but realistically, it was just that one game where you had a ton of points that influenced the mean. So the mean is heavily influenced by outliers. All right, let's move on and start talking about the other form of center we're going to talk about here, and that's the median. So the median, we use a capital M to represent the median. It is the midpoint of the distribution. This is the number such that half the values are smaller and half the values are larger. So the median is simply a location. It does not take all the values into account like the mean does. To find the median, you have to arrange all of the observations in order, smallest to largest. And then you're going to use the following formula to find the location of the median. I can't emphasize enough. This formula does not find the median. It finds the location of the median. It tells you where in your data to look to find the median. So if you have an odd amount of data, the median will fall at a specific value. Just think about that for a second. Let me kind of make some dots here. If you have one, two, three, four, five pieces of data, then there is an exact middle right here. It has two values below it, and it has two values above it. That is the median. If you have one, two, three, four, five, six pieces of data, well, the median actually falls right here where it's kind of like a no man's land, right? There's three values below, three values above, but there is no actual value dead set in the center. So to find the median in this case, you basically take the middle two values and average them together. So you add them up and divide by two. So here's an example. Let's go back to our commute times. If you recall that there were 15 commute times, five all the way through 60. So to find the location of the median, you take your sample size. Remember sample size, we're going to use the letter N to represent sample size. That's the 15. So sample size plus one is 16. 16 divided by two is eight. That means the median falls at the eighth position. So all we got to do is count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There is the eighth position, and that is the median. So the median of our set of data there would be exactly 20, where there are half the values below it, half the values are above it. All right, here's an example with an even amount of data. So let's just say we looked at uh, the city or the, um, you know, the state of New York, and here are the 20 times, the 20 commute times for 20 workers in New York City. Okay, well, 20 is, you know, an even number. So when we do the formula to find the location of the median, we do sample size 20 plus 1 is 21, divided by 2 is 10 and a half. That means that I'm going to look between the 10th and the 11th piece of data to find the median. So I have a nice little um, stem plot here, which is nice. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So that means the median is going to fall right in between here. And remember, those values are 20 
and 25 using the key there for the stem plot. So my median falls right in between because it's an even set of data. There is no actual median value. I have to calculate what it would be. But again, using this formula, it's the 10.5, which means that it's between the 10th and the 11th piece of data. So I found my 10th piece of data, 20, and the uh, 11th piece of data is 25. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add those together. 20 plus 25 is 45 and divide by 2. That means my median for for this set of data would be 22.5 minutes. Once again, that's the average, that's the middle of 20 and 25. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, a couple facts about the median. The median, sorry for the typo there, the median, and there should be no A there, um, the median is not affected by the influence of extreme observations. If large values are to the far right or the far left, the median doesn't care. Boy, I really spelled median wrong a couple of times there, so sorry. It should be I-A-N. I'm a terrible speller. Anyway, again, large values don't affect the median. So let's go back to those two sets of data we looked at earlier with the mean. Again, every value is the same except for the max. Here is 13, and here it's 50, 50 being a clear outlier. Now, the median doesn't give a crap about those outlying values. The median just wants to be the middle of the data. So again, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 pieces of data. 7 plus 1 divided by 2, 7 plus 1 is 8, 8 divided by 2 is 4. That means the median falls at the fourth value. So 1, 2, 3, 4, there's my median. 1, 2, 3, 4, there's my median. My median is 10 no matter what. Even though there's this outlier of 50, median doesn't care. He just wants to be the exact center. Three values below, three values above. Doesn't care what those values are. So keep in mind that the mean is definitely influenced by outliers where the median is not. So, comparing the mean and median. When data has a roughly symmetric distribution, the mean and the median are fairly close together. When data is skewed either way, the mean will go towards the tail because it has to adjust for those values that are extremely high, extremely low. So, let's draw a kind of symmetric data here. So, I'm just going to try a curve there to make it quick. Nice and symmetric, right? Left side, right side look about the same. In this case, the mean X bar and the median, capital N, will fall at about the same place directly in the middle. However, when we have data that is skewed to the right, meaning most of the data is on the left, a little down the right, what's going to happen is there's a very few large values, very few. Again, most of the data is down here at the small values. But because of those few large values, the mean is going to get pulled in that direction. So the median might fall here, while the mean falls a little bit higher because it's going to get pulled towards those outlying values. Same thing's going to happen if I'm skewed left. Again, skewed left means most of the data is on the right-hand side, very, very few of the lower numbers on the left. But once again, because of those lower values, the mean has to adjust for them. So the median might fall here, that right dead set in the middle, but the mean might go a little bit smaller because of those outliers to the left. So once again, even just a couple small or large values will drag the mean towards them. But when we look up at symmetric data, when we have a couple low values and a couple high values, it balances out and the mean ends up being right smack dab in the middle. So, which do we want to use? Would I rather have you tell me the mean or would I rather have you tell me the median? Well, it all comes down to what the data looks like. If the data is symmetric, then we would rather you use the mean if there's no extreme values affecting it. If the data is skewed left, or skewed right, or has some major outliers, I would much rather you give me the median because it would not be influenced by those values. Hopefully that makes a lot of sense. So look at the data for the 20 commute times for those in New York City. Which will be larger, the mean or the median? Well, once again, if we look at our data, I kind of turn the data on the side so you can see that it's skewed to the right. Skewed to the right. Again, most of the data is here on the left. Now, there weren't a whole lot of extremely high commute times, but there was this one right here, this 85 minutes. That 85 minute is going to pull the mean towards it. So in this case, the mean is going to be larger than the median. The median is going to be at the exact middle no matter what. So I have 20 times, remember we did this earlier, 20 plus 1 divided by 2, that's going to be the 20 plus 1 is 21, 21 divided by 2 is 10.5, this is going to be the 10.5 piece of data is where the median is, so we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, so this right here is where the median is going to be. 
So the mean would be 22, or the median would be 22.5, but because that outlier, the mean is going to average a little bit higher. All right, guys, that's it for part one. Stay tuned for video part two.